For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. In the 16th century, a dramatic series of religious, social, and political protests produced a new and influential form of Christianity. It soon grew to rival Catholicism and Orthodoxy as the third great branch of the largest religion in Europe. Later, Protestant Christianity would spread worldwide in one of the largest religious movements in history. Protestantism, or Protestant Christianity, gained its name from the Protestation, that is the document of protest, issued in 1529 by six German princes and representatives of 14 South German cities. This alliance was rebelling against the religious decisions of the Imperial Diet of Speyer, which had tried to unify the territories of the Holy Roman Empire, that is the lands of modern Switzerland, Austria and Germany, by requiring uniformity of worship. The document declares two principles that are the heart of the Protestant understanding of Christianity. The same pair of principles had been declared by the German priest Martin Luther at his famous confrontation with both the Roman Catholic Church and the Holy Roman Emperor in 1521. The first principle is that the Word of God is a greater authority than any human authority. The second principle is that conscience alone justifies opposition to certain ecclesiastical decrees. In the city of Worms, a combination of territorial rulers and church leaders had met in what was called the Diet of Worms, and they summoned Luther to appear and demanded that he retract his views. The confrontation between Luther and the Roman Catholic Church would lead to the protestation eight years later. Protestantism began as a modest movement to address certain grievances within the existing structure of church and state. Even after Luther appealed to conscience over church authority, he cautioned some of his more radical followers that just any theological view could not be permitted. The protesters at Speyer argued for freedom of religious conscience, but only as a way to defend their own understanding of Christianity. Two themes stand at the center of the Protestant tradition. One is the reliance on the authority of Scripture. This ancient body of writings illumines the way we see the world. The second theme at the heart and center of the Protestant movement has been this conviction that we are forgiven even though we are unforgivable, that we do not earn our salvation. It is given to us freely as a gift. We are enabled to be what we are. The invention of the printing press about a century earlier was making copies of the Bible more widely available. Many Christians now wanted to decide for themselves what scripture means. Despite such disagreements, the first generation of Protestant Christians wanted their followers to affirm several shared theological convictions. They focused on what they perceived to be the church's errors. The Genevan Confession declared that by focusing glory on God alone, Protestants would not succumb to the glorification of things human, which had become so prominent in the Roman Catholic Church. The Reformation in the Holy Roman Empire soon had two factions, one led by Luther in the north and the other by Ulrich Zwingli in the south. These two Protestant factions could manage only to agree that they would disagree. Another early Protestant principle was called the priesthood of all believers. This principle did not mean that there should be no ministers, nor did it mean that social hierarchies should be abolished. The priesthood of believers meant that all persons have unmediated access to God. They don't have to go through a priest.
Luther made a similar point by proclaiming that all baptized Christians are priests. Thus, each person has a right, even an obligation, to be concerned about what's right or wrong in the faith. Lay persons should not be deterred by those who claim this task is for experts. Luther had a special interest in examining the nature of the religious life, perhaps because he had been a monk. Now he argued that all honest work done in the service of God qualifies as a holy life. It also meant that all vocations are equal in the sight of God. Yet another implication emerged from the new Protestant focus on the Bible. The Bible was translated into the languages of the people and it was printed and distributed for reading and interpretation. Protestants referred to the Bible as the source and authority of the faith and they saw it as a book for the people, the center of personal and corporate devotion and worship. But there remains a problem. Since Protestants contended that all persons in the church are ministers, why should there be any special designation? Most of these early reformers believed that ministers had to be chosen to do certain tasks. The Bible was now to be understood rather than dramatized. It became more important than ever before that lay people should be able to read and that they should be educated in the basic doctrines of the faith. The minister's task was not so much to conduct a formal ritual, but rather to expound the word or proclaim the gospel. The sermon thus became the central event of the worship experience. Some groups, such as the Quakers of the mid-17th century, objected to so-called hireling ministers who accepted payment for their services. They complained that this separated the ministers from the laity. After the struggles, conflicts and debates of the Reformation's first decades, there emerged four distinct institutional forms of Protestantism. They are the Lutheran, Reformed, Radical and Anglican expressions of Protestantism. These movements appeared first in Europe, then in America and other parts of the world. The first of the Protestant movements was the Lutheran tradition. Lutheranism began when the Catholic priest Martin Luther in 1517 nailed a list of 95 theses to the door of his church in Wittenberg, Germany. Luther drew deeply on his own tortuous experience in coming to a new understanding of the faith. Luther insisted that we humans are not able to be righteous by ourselves and that righteousness comes from God alone in the forgiveness of sins. In worship, Luther retained more elements of the traditional Catholic Mass than did other Protestant groups. He believed some of these rituals represented an ancient and honorable tradition. But the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation, which says that during communion the wine and bread literally change into the body and blood of Christ, was replaced by Luther with a doctrine of real presence. Luther's revised doctrine says that the wine and bread are not metaphysically altered, but that Jesus becomes really present during the Lord's Supper. Luther based his doctrine on Jesus' declaration at the Last Supper, where he broke the bread and said, this is my body. Lutherans retained the two sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper, but the other five Catholic sacraments of confirmation, penance, anointing of the sick, holy orders and matrimony were either dropped or given a reduced status below that of a sacrament. Luther contended that Christ did not institute them and that these other sacraments also lack the promise of grace. By the same token, Luther dropped Roman Catholic devotional symbols including purgatory, the panoply of saints and the treasury of merit. Luther believed that all these symbols were not biblically grounded. Ulrich Zwingli was a thoroughly political pastor. As an ardent Swiss patriot, he defended the rights of his canton against the encroachments of outside political and ecclesiastical authorities. When Zwingli took up his position as pastor of the great minster in Zurich in 1519, he attracted attention by declaring that he would preach continuously from the New Testament. 
Zwingli said he would test all religious piety by the authority of scripture alone. This led him to oppose several traditional Catholic practices such as fasting, prayer to the saints, the doctrine of purgatory, and the obligation to pay tithes. The Zurich Council called for a public disputation between Zwingli and the representatives of the bishop. For this occasion, Zwingli produced 67 articles, several of which focused on the emerging theme of freedom from ecclesiastical rules and restrictions. Zwingli's variation eventually was to develop into a standard. Zwingli's variation eventually was to develop into a standard for the reformed churches. In contrast to the Lutheran approach, Zwingli contended that the church should do only what is affirmed in the scriptures. It cannot simply avoid what is condemned. Different reformed churches variously applied this more rigorous principle, but in the end, they eliminated much more of the traditional Catholic liturgy than the Lutherans did. Art was very important in churches before the Reformation. Many of the people couldn't read. The language of the service was not a language they could understand, and so they would sit in the sanctuary and not really know what was happening. They did not participate in the service and art that they could look at, they could read the pictures that were in the stained glass, the paintings, the statues, became so important to them. And unfortunately, there was a point for some that the art became more important than the event it was representing. And that was part of the Reformation focus. They wanted to get away from that. We were honoring the artwork, not the subject. Unfortunately, many wonderful works of art were destroyed in the Reformation. Some people took the approach that the only way to cure it was to get rid of all the art, and that was most unfortunate. The Reformed tradition also searched to find the appropriate biblical model for organizing church government. John Calvin, the French minister in Geneva, found his model in a fourfold order of ministry that he said had been instituted by Jesus. These four orders were pastors, doctors, or what we would call teachers, elders, and deacons. Many theological differences prevented the Lutherans and the Reformed community from cooperating under a common Protestant umbrella. The most divisive issue had to do with the Lord's Supper. Zwingli thought that Luther's concept of real presence was still too close to the Catholic doctrine of transubstantiation. He argued that bread and wine signify or represent the body and blood of Christ and communion is then a memorial of what Christ has done. Zwingli believed the Lord's Supper is distinctly secondary to the service of the Word. He suggested that the Supper should be celebrated quarterly, thus opposing Luther's desire to keep Word and Sacrament together in regular worship. The Reformed people also received the elements where they were seated rather than coming forward to the table. Religious radicals emerged early in the Reformation. This entire group of radicals represents a third branch of the Protestant movement. There were four distinct types of radicals. These were the revolutionary theocrats, the spiritualists, the anti-Trinitarians, and the Anabaptists. The revolutionary theocrats and the spiritualists emerged early in the German Reformation. Thomas Munzer claimed to have received a revelation that supposedly transcended scripture, and he believed this revelation would be fulfilled within history. Munzer called on the elect to separate from the godless, and he declared that the Christian princes should take up the sword to establish the rule of God. For more than a century, Munster would be a symbol to both mainstream Protestants and Roman Catholics, but radicals go to dangerous lengths in their efforts to overthrow existing society. A third group of radical reformers were the anti-Trinitarians. The most famous of these in the 16th century was Miguel Servetto, a Spanish physician and philosopher known in English as Michael Servetus. Arrested in Geneva in 1553 by civil authorities, Servetus was tried for heresy and sentenced to death. His execution was important for the Protestant self-understanding. It produced a debate 
about the substance of Protestant faith. His execution also produced a defense of religious liberty that would become crucial for later Protestants. John Calvin participated in condemning Servetus to burn at the stake, and for him, the execution was a triumph of truth over heresy. The term Anabaptist still is occasionally used to label several of these radical groups, but this term more properly fits one smaller group whose members aim to restore the apostolic pattern of life that existed among the earliest Christian communities. The label Anabaptist was actually a term invented by the opponents of these groups. Anabaptist means rebaptizer, and the term is used to label groups who believe that baptism is not for infants. Anabaptists believe that baptism is only for those who can confess their faith. The most significant of the Anabaptist groups were the Swiss Brethren, the Mennonites, and the Hutterites. The Mennonites, named for their leading theologian and former priest, Menno Simons, were found in the Netherlands and North Germany after 1540. In North America, descendants of the Mennonite heritage include a number of Amish communities in rural parts of several states and in Western Canada. Anabaptists were imprisoned, banished or executed at varying rates over the 16th and 17th centuries. The legal reasons for these persecutions were violation of civil law, rebellion and heresy. All of this persecution was extensive enough to create among Anabaptists the sense of a martyr's church. It's impossible for Baptists to document their history as some denominations can do. Uh, documentation is difficult for a persecuted group. The fact that we wouldn't be shoved about in religious matters, we were persecuted severely, even to the point of death in our early days, especially where rulers would hand a dec decree down that everybody in that country join the same church. Well, we felt that church membership ought to grow out of religious experience. Each individual has to have a personal experience with the Lord. Some people think you have to be baptized to be saved. Baptists have never held that. They believe that you're saved by grace through faith. But we baptize by immersion because it is a portrayal of what happened to Christ. He was killed. He was buried, he rose again. And the baptism comes after the conversion, not as a part of it. And so is betrayed what has happened to the individual in his trust in Christ. He's buried to an old life of sin, raised to a new life in Christ Jesus. For over a thousand years, England had been Catholic. In the year 1509, Henry VIII ascended the throne. He took a wife, Catherine of Aragon, but she and Henry were unable to produce a male heir. By 1527, Henry had decided that the marriage should be dissolved, but the Pope refused to grant an annulment. The English Parliament passed the Supremacy Act in 1534, which declared King Henry VIII to be the supreme head of the Church of England. Some saw this legislation as the beginning of Protestantism in England. Others saw the Anglican Church as the continuation of the Catholic Church, yet now as an English church with a local authority, the king. The Church of England in the 16th century was meant to be a truly national church. It was to be the church in England, not a separate denomination, necessarily the church of all the people. In one sense, it was the logical development of what was happening in Europe at this time. Nation states were coming into being. They were unhappy with an international power such as the papacy. And from the 14th century on in France and Italy and Germany and Spain, all countries were, were saying we're happy to remain Roman Catholic in theology, but we want control of our own church. In one sense, that's all Henry VIII wanted. To those who saw all this as a continuation of the Catholic Church, the Church of England now became a middle way between Protestantism and Roman Catholicism. The Protestant Thomas Cranmer helped solve Henry's marriage problem by proposing that the issue be put not to the Pope, but to the theologians of the universities. The first Book of Common Prayer, 
brought out in 1549 and revised in 1552, had been largely the work of Thomas Cranmer. This is the 1549 book, Cranmer's first book of common prayer. His importance was that he took much of the beauty of the Catholic liturgy of the Middle Ages and translated it into the vernacular so that it could be accessible to all the people. Anglicanism has always felt that as important as the clergy are, as important as bishops are, the true people of God are the laity, the, all the baptized. And now they could fully participate in the worship, thanks to Thomas Cranmer's work. In 1533, Cranmer became Archbishop of Canterbury. In 1553, Catholicism was restored in England when Mary, the Catholic daughter of Catherine of Aragon, became queen. Cranmer was burned at the stake, along with a few hundred other Protestant heretics. Other Protestants fled to the European continent, chiefly to Protestant cities such as Strasbourg, Frankfurt, and Geneva. When Mary died in 1558, Elizabeth acceded to the throne. She was the daughter of Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII's second wife. And as Queen Elizabeth, she was virtually compelled by this heritage to side with the Protestants. England reverted to Protestantism, and now the Protestant exiles could return to assist in Protestantizing the Church of England. Among those who dissented from the Anglican pattern were a group called the Puritans. Puritanism was born in part from a dispute about church government. One early dispute involved the continuing use of vestments or items worn by ministers involved the continuing use of vestments or items worn by ministers in worship services. One of the distinctive symbols of the bishop is the crozier. The bishop is the chief pastor of the people and pastor of course means shepherd. The idea of the crozier as a symbol of authority and of being the chief pastor was of course that the bishop could reach out and rescue those who need rescuing. Some bishops over the years have also enjoyed pointing out that the crozier has another end, a sharp pointed stick where, when necessary, the bishop can prod someone who may need it. Some of these Puritans in England could be called Presbyterian. Puritans thought a great deal about the seriousness of sin, its remedy, and the need for God to effect conversion in an individual soul. They were convinced that the true Church of God does not have bishops, and they were committed to a learned ministry for proclaiming the word in preaching. The Puritans later came to be called independents, then Congregationalists. Some of these independents practiced baptism of adult believers, and they became known as Baptists. Both the established Church, as well as the State of England, joined to resist these critics, persecuting many of them. After the Protestant era of reform, a period of consolidation began to draw theological and political boundaries in Europe. In 1555, the Peace of Augsburg ended the wars between the Lutherans and the Catholic armies of the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V. This settlement allowed each territorial ruler within the empire to determine whether his land would be Lutheran or Catholic. No other faith was allowed. In France, intermittent religious warfare ended with the Edict of Nantes in 1598. This edict granted a degree of religious liberty to French Protestants called Huguenots, but it was rescinded almost a century later. The Huguenots were forced either to retreat to the mountains of France or to emigrate. In the early 17th century, James VI of Scotland became King James I of England, and he held a conference to settle dispute between Anglican bishops and reformers. Although the conference failed to settle major issues involving church government and worship, it did call for an official English translation of the Bible to be used in all British churches. The so-called authorized version of the Bible, better known as the King James Version, appeared in 1611. In the 17th century, the Thirty Years' War was fought in the territories of the Holy Roman Empire and it ended with the Peace of Westphalia in 1648. The Empire now recognized the Reformed Churches.
in addition to the Catholics and Lutherans. The English civil wars of the 1640s gave freedoms for a few years to Presbyterians, to independent dissenters, and to the Quakers. Founded by George Fox in the late 1640s and known to their members as the Society of Friends, Quakers held several convictions that were regarded as very radical by the rest of the society. Quakers contended that traditional Protestant practices such as worship, baptism, and the Lord's Supper were externals and should be rejected. They permitted no special order of ministers, and because of this, women came to exercise more leadership in the Quaker community than in other Protestant bodies. They believed in immediate revelation through the Spirit's work in the lives of faithful persons, and they regarded biblical revelation to be a distinctly secondary rule. This revelation could be discerned through the inner light which God has given to all persons. People come in and settle into silence, just walk in one by one or with their families, and that silence will continue for about an hour, depending on what's happening and, and how people are moved. It starts way back with early Quakers, which is the concept of that of God in everyone. And then everything sort of falls off from that, including continuing revelation and search for truth. For me to stand up and break the silence, to me, feels like I'm only going to do it when my heart is thumping and I know that it's something that I, that I really have to say. But it feels like there's often a, a spirit moving in the group. As the 17th century wore on, some Reformed and Lutheran Protestants began to complain about the character of the faith and religious life that had emerged from the competing efforts to define orthodoxy. These critics were called pietists. Pietism produced a large amount of practical activity, including attention to social issues like education, relief for the poor, abolition of slavery, and temperance. The English religious experiment ended when England's monarchy was restored under Charles II in 1660, and the Anglican religion was quickly re-established. Protestants outside the Church of England now became officially known as dissenters, and the Toleration Act of 1689 permitted their worship services. The evangelical revival took place in quite different circumstances in continental Europe, Britain, and Britain's American colonies. One historian has identified four qualities of evangelical religion. First is an interest in conversion to Christianity based on the belief that lives need to be changed. Second, the message of the gospel is expressed in both personal and social effort. Third, there is also a high regard for the Bible. And last, the evangelical view of the atonement stresses that it's not enough to revere Jesus as a spiritual leader, Evangelicals proclaim that Jesus was a savior who was sacrificed on the cross for the sins of humanity. One of the most important forms of 18th century evangelical Christianity was the Methodist movement, founded and led by the Anglican minister John Wesley. Wesley's understanding of the Christian message and the Christian task reflected the ideals of pietism in several respects. The Wesleyan movement aimed to renew existing institutions rather than establish a new religious institution. It focused on lay people, and it stressed growth in holiness more than theological correctness. For Wesley, the heart of Christianity is love for God and love for neighbor. He wasn't concerned primarily with uh, intellectual understanding of the faith as he was living that faith out in people's lives. But on several points, Wesley went further than the pietists had gone a century earlier. He believed each human being has a role in his or her salvation. This meant that he opposed the doctrine of predestination. On the question of whether God's grace is offered only to some or to all, Wesley threw down a gauntlet for the Calvinists. Because of his uh, belief in the all-encompassing grace of God which was for all and in all in his words and therefore he proclaimed the message of God's redeeming love for all people gathered those people into small groups nurtured them in the faith and then he sent uh, persons to America to continue that same movement he had no intention of starting a new church he was merely interested in again 
spreading scriptural holiness throughout the lands. The painting of Offer Them Christ was done with such tremendous research that it's as though we could look into the late 1700s and see John Wesley sending Thomas Coate to America. The research is so complete that the sun is in the correct position, the clouds are right for that particular time of the year, the water level is correct, and fortunately the painter could go to England, look at this particular area, so those things he could look at, study, and accurately portray. Wesley formed small groups organized by gender and marital status. He also developed an organization of lay preachers to travel among Methodist communities. John Wesley died in 1791. During his lifetime, the Methodist movement had remained a part of the Anglican Church. But after his death, it gradually developed into a separate religious body. A typical Protestant worship service features Bible reading, prayers, a sermon, and singing by the entire congregation. Yet what Protestants sing and how they do it have changed considerably over the centuries. During the 16th century, the early years of Protestantism, singing usually had involved metrical psalms. Protestants had claimed that Christian praise could use only the Word of God, so they said the Psalter was the Christian hymn book. But while Psalmody provided such classic hymns as the Old Hundredth, only so many variations could be used from the ancient psalm texts. John Wesley was impressed by the power of music to move hearers and arouse their affections, and the Methodist movements took full advantage of the opportunity. Wesley recommended building octagonal chapels because their acoustics were good for preaching and singing. John Wesley was keenly aware that overemphasized or inappropriate music could divert people from the appropriate spiritual intent. So he proposed that only authorized hymn books and tunes should be used in Methodist meetings. Wesley's brother Charles provided thousands of Methodist verses on a great number of topics. If you really want to know what Methodists believe, you can find it best by reading and singing Charles Wesley's hymns, probably, than any other way. And a theology that will sing is a theology that will have an impact on a society and on person, is a theology that will have an impact on a society and on persons. Some of the best known ones, known by all Christians, probably, are Hark the Herald Angels Sing. Christ the Lord is risen today, O oh, for a thousand tongues to sing, love divine all loves excelling. Um, those are the kinds of, of words and hymns, uh, songs that get into the very soul and fabric of people and a whole society. Protestant hymnody flowered in the 19th century. Hymns and songs supported the causes of voluntary organizations such as mission societies and temperance groups. Hymnody shaped particular events like revival services. The basic convictions of a religious community also could be reinforced and remembered in its music, which in turn could be revised for different settings. The Anglican Church dominated America's earliest settlements in 17th century Virginia. As we'll see later, Anglicanism also would come to dominate the later colonies of the Deep South. In the middle colonies, Settlers in New York and New Jersey were mostly Dutch Reformed and Scots-Irish Presbyterians. The Quakers settled in Pennsylvania. This mixture resulted in greater religious diversity in the middle colonies than in the other colonies. Puritan settlers in the north favored a middle way. They were neither sectarian nor Episcopal, but a collection of individual congregations whose members ruled the community. They settled in New England in the hope of establishing a holy experiment that would become a light to the nations. Conversion to the Puritan style of faith included a series of stages that persons should go through. But the New England way had hardly begun before there were challenges and dissent. Roger Williams 
a Puritan minister, opposed the mixture of civil and religious authority in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. Williams was banished, only to begin the colony of Rhode Island on a quite different religious foundation. Anne Hutchinson charged that Puritan ministers were making human works a part of the conversion process. Her accusation sharply penetrated the heart of Puritan theology. Hutchinson was tried before the ministers, and she too was banished. Later, Quakers came to the Massachusetts Bay Colony to preach on the work of the Holy Spirit and to argue for toleration of dissenting beliefs. They too were banished. Some of the banished Quakers returned to Massachusetts, and on the second arrest, they were imprisoned or hanged. In 1742, the Congregational Minister of the Northampton Church, Jonathan Edwards, wrote about what people were calling a great and general awakening in the colonies. The awakening in America was somewhat similar to developments in Europe, yet it was so dramatic that Edwards had a reason to think that God was doing something special in America. A revival of religion now focused on converting those outside the church and on separating from those who had not been converted. Strong sentiments on these kinds of issues split Presbyterians into the so-called new side, which defended the awakening, and their old side opponents. This Presbyterian schism lasted for some 20 years. In the end, the Great Awakening proved to be one of the most influential religious movements in American history. In the 18th century, the American South contained only the four colonies of Virginia, North Carolina, South Carolina, and Georgia. All but Virginia were sparsely settled. But the traditions that started in the South eventually made a dramatic impact on Protestantism in America. Baptists and Methodists in the South called one another brother and sister, and they included slaves in their religious families. And Southerners focused more on issues of personal holiness, often condemning dancing and drinking. The Southerners tried to reproduce the Anglican religious establishment, and this eventually would become known as the Episcopal Church in the United States. The new religious style of the 18th century awakenings transformed the encounter between America's black and white races. Evangelical Christianity in the American South generally welcomed all kinds and conditions of people, including black preachers, who then became leaders of chiefly Baptist and Methodist religious communities. Many evangelicals were opposed to slavery itself, but in the early 19th century, white evangelicalism largely backed away from anti-slavery positions, and black evangelicalism essentially went on a separate track. In November of 1786, the most dramatic breakaway from the mother church, St. George's uh, Methodist Church in Philadelphia, happened when Absalom Jones, William White, and Richard Allen were attempting to kneel in prayer at the altar. The deacons of the church, which was predominantly a white church, physically removed them, and the congregation, the, the black segment of the congregation, was uh, quite incensed, and they, in a very dramatic way, marched out. Out of this, between 1787 and 1791, the AME Church under the name of uh, the First Church, Mother Bethel in Philadelphia was born. The new religious style of the 19th century was increasingly based on democratic values, something the Methodists and Baptists possessed in abundance. In their ministers, they wanted enthusiasm more than education, and they actively encouraged lay participation in all aspects of the work, including preaching. Traveling preachers adapted especially well to the expanding Western frontier, and the Methodist and Baptist emphasis on free will rather than predestination fit the spirit of the nation. This outlook became the foundation of a new burst of revivals in the first third of the 19th century. The spiritual energy of these revivals spawned new Protestant denominations like the Cumberland Presbyterian Church and the Christian Church, or Disciples of Christ. 
Part of the phenomenon that was sweeping Kentucky at that time was the Second Great Awakening, and particularly the Great Revival at Cane Ridge in August 1801. And it turned out to be the most climatic and the grandest of all of those great revivals. There were people of all and no religious persuasion. But interesting enough, a phenomenon broke out that has been puzzling to us both at that time and ever since, that people were caught up in spiritual exercises. Some would roll, some would bark like dogs, some would be caught up in great gales of laughter. And it is a puzzlement, but who is to explain everything that relates to the spirit? There was then one accord though, and that is the power of this moment to transcend the divisions among the denomination. Presbyterians listening to Methodist, Methodists listening to Baptist. How good it was to be together in the same spirit in the worship of God. Women were not often able to become Protestant leaders, but many of them were caught up in the excitement and used it in their own ways. Frances Willard organized women to support the cause of temperance. Some women, like Jerina Lee, claimed the right to preach. The so-called modern age has been characterized with such suggestive terms as liberal and democratic. It has been a time for the development of industrial empires and urban complexes. Modernity also has been characterized by ways of thinking that include capitalism, nationalism, colonialism, and Darwinism. For Protestants, the modern age was full of both opportunity and anxiety. Liberal Protestants believed that religious faith is consistent with scholarly criticism, and that one can cast off much of the old outlook in order to preserve the essence of the Christian message. For liberals, the worst thing Christians could do would be to try to protect or insulate the Bible from its critics. For liberal Protestants, then, the Bible is a human and a historical book, just as religion is a human phenomenon. The 19th century also saw a conservative resurgence among Protestants, and not just from old-time religionists, or those who literally interpreted the creation accounts in Genesis. Liberals had claimed that humans have the capacity to know the will of God. Conservatives argued to the contrary, that God is only known through biblical revelation. Biblical texts speak of the so-called last days, and Jesus Christ was expected to return in glory. Premillennialists believed that the world was fast approaching this millennium, they rejected the liberal hope in human possibilities for this world. They claimed instead that Christ's return would be cataclysmic, carrying believers out of the world to be with God. And I saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. Some millennial views produced new religious bodies in the 19th century. Most notable were the Adventist churches, which emerged after a New York farmer, William Miller, predicted that Christ would come again in 1844. Liberals and conservatives coexisted in many of the same denominations. At the extreme edges of the debate, there were some notable skirmishes, including denominational schisms and even heresy trials. But these conflicts mostly went on without major institutional readjustment. In the 20th century, the ecumenical movement also has renewed the Christian assessment of other religions. The old attitude of rejecting and condemning non-Christian religions has been challenged. The traditional evangelical message of simplicity and clarity, focusing on the reliability of the Bible and salvation in Jesus Christ, has attracted a great following in the latter half of the 20th century. Just as religiously conservative Protestants have supported politically conservative causes, so religiously liberal Protestants have actively supported politically liberal causes. Issues like homosexuality, abortion, foreign policy, and environmentalism have become religious hot buttons. They invoke powerful religious ideals and commitments as Christians struggle with issues that inflame modern political life. Protestant 
is a broad and flexible term. If asked by a survey, few who belong to Protestant churches would identify themselves first as a Protestant. A more likely first description would be Christian, or the name of a particular denomination, or a defining adjective such as Evangelical or Pentecostal. Various Protestants have differing views of the nature of the church, of ministry, of worship, and of religious authority. They celebrate baptism and the Lord's Supper in different ways, and they attach different meanings to these two sacraments. And despite the diversity of Protestant ideas, with the volatility that this brings, Protestantism's fundamental commitments continue to give meaning and vitality to this large and worldwide expression of the Christian religion.